Okay, uh, today we're lucky to have uh, Frank de Meyer with us, uh, giving us a talk. Frank is a PhD student at Tilburg where he's been since 2019. Uh, he works in polyhedral and semi-definite programming methods for combinatorial optimization. He's uh, already received several awards, including the Brouwer Award for Best Master's Thesis in the Netherlands in 2019, and the Informs Meritorious Paper Award in 2021. I've also been informed through back channels that he plays drums in a band and is active in the theater. So I'm sure he'll give us a good show today. Uh, so please go ahead, Frank. Thanks, Steve, for this uh, very nice introduction. And also uh, thanks for inviting me here. So it's a real uh, pleasure to be, uh, yeah, be here, at least online. Um, so indeed, I would like to talk today about uh, one of my most recent research projects with one of my supervisors, Renata Sotiro, which is also joining online today, I've seen. So it's about the Schwatagomery procedure for integer SDPs with applications in combinatorial optimization. So it all gathers around uh, the so-called integer SDPs, and they are exactly what you would think they are. So they are semi-definite programming problems where some or all of the variables are required to be integral. And somehow those two properties, on one hand, uh, integrality, and on the other hand, positive semi-definiteness, Together, they bring so much structure to uh, matrices or to data that we can model a lot of problems as integer SDPs, as what I will also show um, in a minute. And therefore, it's quite surprising that there have been only very recently papers specifically focusing on those type of problems. And today, we would like to contribute to that, uh, to that field by looking at the so-called Schwatagomery procedure, which is an um, established result in the world of integer linear programming. And today I would like to extend some of those results or some of those uh, methodologies to integer SDPs in both theory and practice. So let's see what I'm going to present today. Um, first, I will formally introduce what are the integer SDPs. And also I give, will give a um, recap on what is the Schottergomery procedure for general convex compact sets. Then in the second part of the talk here, I will uh, combine the two. So how do Schwatagomery cuts, uh, how they are they constructed for integer SDPs? What are certain properties, et cetera? So this is more the theoretical part of the talk. And then after that, I will more look at the practical side. So how can we apply and exploit Schwatagomery cuts in order to solve the integer SDPs to optimality? And then I will finalize everything um, by looking at an application to this combinatorial problem called the quadratic traveling salesman problem. Um, where everything I hope will come together. Okay, let's move to the to the the formal definition of integer SDPs. So let's first introduce some terminology. We let S n be the uh, vector space of the n by n symmetric matrices, and on that vector space we define here this to be the trace in a product between uh, two matrices. So if we have two symmetric matrices, the trace in a product could be seen as taking the element wise product and then summing up everything. And now we can present an integer SDP in its standard primal form as follows. So I think the, the people who are familiar with semi-definite programming here recognize the standard primal form for continuous SDPs. Um, so we here have a minimization over the trace in a product of our matrix variable X and some symmetric matrix C, subject to affine constraints that we have over here, also defined by this trace in a product. We assume that we have, have M of them, then x is required to be positive semi-definite. And additionally, here we require that the entries of x are integral. So that's what we add here on the primal of the continuous SDP. Now, of course, we also have a dual formulation, as you would expect. So again, here we recognize the standard dual formulation of um, SDPs, where additionally here the vector x has integral entries. It's somehow or somewhat arbitrary which of the two uh, versions we look at. And we can always rewrite one in terms of the other. Um, so in this talk, I will uh, take the dual formulation as our standard formulation. But again, that's an arbitrary choice. So we look at those problems. Um, now some variations exist. For instance, we could have that only a part of the variables is restricted to be integral. And we are talking about the mixed integer SDPs. And it will not be surprised that those type of problems are in general MP hard. One way to see this is by um, considering diagonal matrices here for the C and the AIs, then those problems boil down to just the integer linear programs, which are, of course, MP hard to solve. 
and you might uh, imagine that solving integer SDPs is a very hard task. So in general, integer problems are, of course, uh, theoretically and be hard. Solving SDPs is, um, although theoretically can be done efficiently, in practice for large sizes, it will be difficult. So the combination of the two will not be easy uh, in practice, but it has some applications or actually many. Uh, it, the first one originated from trust topology optimization. I think this was the first uh, real application of integer SDPs that appeared in the literature. Also in other fields like signal processing and control systems that I'm not really familiar with. I'm a bit more familiar with the combinatorial problems like the TSP, uh, the max cut problem, graph partitioning problems. They can be um, modeled all as integer SDPs. And maybe I should mention here that if we move in integrality, then we really really aiming at solving the problem to optimality. So normally, if we talk about SDPs and combinatorial optimizations, we are uh, looking at relaxations of the problem, but we really try to solve those problems to optimality. That's the goal. Okay, let's then look at the method. I promise to first give an overview, an introduction on the shuttle Gomery procedure in general. So suppose that C here is a compact, convex set, set, and we would like to optimize over this set, but then only required, only restricted to the integer points. Well, one very important set then is the so-called integer hole, which is the convex hole of all the, uh, the intersection of C with all in integer points. And ideally, we'd like to have some description of this set that is known. And of course, we can optimize over it uh, in, a, in an easy way. But typically, this set is unknown. So we have to do some uh, work, some procedures exist to approximate this. And the shuttle gomery procedure is one of those methods. So it relies on the so-called shuttle gomery cuts. How does that go? Um, suppose we have a certain uh, vector C with integral entries and some scalar D such that C is contained in the half space induced by this C and D, then uh, we can observe the following. If we have an integral point X, um, then this left-hand side will be integral because C is also having integral entries. So in fact, we can round down the right-hand side if it's not yet integral to obtain a stronger cut. And that cut will still capture all the integer points and therefore it will capture the entire integer whole. And now we can do this for all those type of cuts. And this gives us the so-called Schwattelkomri closure. So we take the infinite intersection over all those strong, stronger Schwattelkomri cuts. So this uh, operator gives us a subset of the, uh, yeah, of the original set C. So it could be a strict subset, does not have to be. And we always know that the integer hole is contained in the Schwattelkomri closure. Now we can repeat this procedure. So we set C0 to be our original set. And now we just apply iteratively this Schwattelkomri closure uh, procedure on the previously obtained set. And this now gives us a sequence where on the right hand side, we have our original set C. Uh, we every time can obtain a subset. It could be a strictly smaller subset. And we know here on the left that um, the integer hole is always contained in uh, all those sets. Well, this sequence can eventually become a hierarchy that really converges to the integer hole. If this happens, we call the smallest k, for which the k Schwattel-Gomery uh, closure is equal to the integer hole. We call that the Schwattel rank of the set. So it's a, a set property. And moreover, um, it is those type of this procedure is studied for many sets uh, in the past decades. Um, one more remarkable result is that. The Schwattel-Gomery closure, actually already the first Schwattel-Gomery closure, uh, appears to be a rational polyhedron for many sets C. That has been proven here. There is a list on the sets for which this is proven. It started with the polyhedra, but later on, I think it was in 2014 here, this was also proven for general compact convex sets. And as a result, we know that all those sets also have a finite Schwattel rank because we know that the rational polyhedra have a finite Schwattel rank. So then, uh, of course, this follows from those two observations. Okay, so having seen now a, a brief introduction on the procedure, let's now apply this to our integer SDP. So recall that we are looking at this dual formulation. Then an important set we can obtain by uh, relaxing the integrality assumption. So this gives us the so-called set P, which is a um, spectrohedron because it is defined by linear matrix inequalities here. And we would like to apply now the Schottel-Gomery procedure on this set P. We can do that. 
Uh, but one problem is that if you look back in the slides, in the previous slide, we saw that the, the Schwader-Gomery procedure as presented over there, it is quite an implicit definition. But take some uh, half space that contains a set, apply a rounding strategy. It does not really, uh, it's not really clear how to obtain those cuts that contain the set. So our first research question here was, can we maybe uh, find a more explicit um, definition of those cuts? Can we maybe use the data matrices C and AI here to construct those cuts? And to do that, we use the following effect, which is very general. So if a matrix D, uh, matrix D is uh, positive semi-definite, even only if the trace in a product with all other positive de definite matrices U is non-negative. This basically says that the SDP cone is self-dual. And we can use this property now to rewrite this condition over here by saying that the trace in a product with this expression with all dual matrices U should be non-negative. So this gives us this equivalent description yeah, by moving out the U's as an, uh, in front as, as an intersection. Why can we do this or why would we like to do this? Well, if we now take a uh, dual matrix U in the positive semi-definite cone and we take it such that it has an integral trace in a product with all our data matrices AI, yeah, then what have we obtained? Well, first, uh, we have, of course, a cut that contains the spectrohedron by the equality on the previous slides. But also we know that the entries of this cut are integral by construction. So we have, in fact, found uh, a C and a D that listen to those properties. And of course, this condition on the right here, we recognize it from the definition of the Schwatter-Gomery closure. So by doing this, we at least identify a subset of the Schwatter-Gomery cuts. And the question is now, can we obtain all Schwatter-Gomery cuts in this way? So can we have, in fact, an arrow also uh, to the left? Well, it's indeed uh, possible to do that. Uh, here is a, the, the theorem. So suppose we have a non-empty spectrohedron P and it is contained by a certain half space induced by C and D. We don't, do not even uh, need integrality on C here. Then we can always find some matrix U such that the trace in a product between all uh, between U and all A I is equal to C I, and the trace in a product between U and C is either D or even smaller than D. Uh, so we obtain even a stronger cut. Well, this can be proven by duality. I think this is uh, maybe clear for for some people. And duality is the argument here, where we also use a regularization step um, to make actually to establish strong duality here. Well, by doing this, we can now um, have an equivalent representation of the Schwarzschild-Gomery closure for spectrohedra that looks as follows. So here we, we now have the intersection over all the dual matrices that have this integral trace inner uh, product property, and we see here the, we recognize the cuts that we had on the previous slide, but now we round the right hand sides down because of the Schwarzschild-Gomery rounding step. So all CG cuts can be verified, uh, can be um, obtained in this way. And by construction, we always know that the integer whole of P is contained in all those cuts. Well, to the best of our knowledge, we are uh, the first that look specifically at those type of cuts uh, to the specific case of spectrohedron or spectrohedron hydra. Um, however, in the literature, there is some results on general conic programs in the cube, in the 0-1 cube by uh, Sezik and Iyengar. They have also identified similar type of cuts, uh, but then for general cones, not only for the SDP cone. Um, what they did is looking at those cuts in a theoretical perspective. So they did not know uh, yet how to separate those kind of, um, of cuts. So they did not um, include it in practical algorithms here. They posted that as an open problem. And we will later on the talk um, elaborate a bit on how we think that could be done. Okay, um, but before we go there, I would like to share some more uh, theoretical results on this procedure. So some um, results that are valid or well known for the linear case, we would like to extend it to the integer semi-definite programming case. Well, the first one uh, that you actually have already seen. So for bounded spectrohedra, we know they are convex and compact. So we already knew that they have a finite Chantal rank. Um, in the paper, we give a simplified proof for that property. And we do that as well for so-called homogeneity property of the closure, which means that if we take a supporting hyperplane K and that supports the uh, spectrohedron P, then taking the intersection with such a hyperplane and taking the Schwarzschild-Gomery closure, those two operators those can commute. So uh, 
that's this equality that's established over here. And this gives us a simplified proof for the fact that a bounded spectrohedron, if we apply the schwatter gomery rounding step, then we obtain a rational polytope, which we also already knew from the literature, but this gives a simplified proof. And finally, what we also did was looking at a so-called strengthening procedure um, that is quite new. It was introduced by Dash et al. in uh, yeah, this year, actually. So it means that sometimes we can exploit the problem structure to provide a rounding that is actually stronger than just rounding to the nearest integer. Um, and this gives us the strengthened shuttle gomery cuts. But in this talk, I will just um, keep, uh, keep it with the original CG cuts to keep the presentation a bit more clear. There's one more um, theorem that I would like to um, yeah, stress out a bit. It's related to this third property here, which says that um, actually we could read this as follows. We need only a finite number of the Schwatagomri cuts to describe the closure, um, but the proofs in the literature for this property are non-constructive. So we know there is some finite number that uh, does the trick, that's sufficient, but we do not actually know which uh, ones. And in fact, we could establish a closed form expression for a certain uh, type of spectrohedron. But that was the, the next goal we would like to achieve, to finding which type of cuts are actually uh, sufficient to describe this set. Well, um, this um, is actually an extension of the following result for rational polyhedra, which was uh, performed by Shriver. So they, uh, what he did was finding a closed form expression for disclosure derived from a so-called totally dual integral representation of a linear system. So maybe you have seen this, maybe this is familiar, but just to uh, recap here, suppose we have an integral matrix A and integral vector B, and we call a system of linear inequalities AX smaller or equal than B. We call a totally dual integral. If the LP dual to this optimization problem has always an integral optimal solution whenever it has an optimal solution, for all integral objective vectors C. And that's a, a property. And that property is actually a sufficient property for proving that uh, polyhedra are rational. So they have rational vertices. So that's where it was originally um, defined for. But Shriver proves that we can also exploit this to find a closed form expression of the Schwatagomri closure. We would like to have an, yeah, a similar property for SDPs. And this would ask for an SDP equivalent to total dual integrality. So the question is, does that actually exist? Uh, well, the answer is yes. And in fact, uh, funny thing is that it comes from your uh, department. So in 2018, there was a paper by Carly Silva and Tunchel um, about a notion of total dual integrality for SDPs. And it started from a notion of integrality uh, of SDPs. So when do we call an SDP uh, integral? or more broadly, what is a good property or a good characterization of exactness of SDPs? And they came with the following property that I call here the property PZ, uh, which reads as follows. So suppose we have a positive semi-definite matrix X, then it satisfies this property if we can decompose it or write it as the sum of rank one matrices that are induced by the subset S of the integers from one to N, that we give a certain non-negative um, integer weight. So this is given by this function y from the power set of the integers from 1 to n to the non-negative integers. So this gives a comp decomposition of x in terms of those rank 1 matrices. Then we call it integral. Well, uh, observe here that this is a bit of a different condition that we have used um, in the past slides, yeah, because there we just say a matrix that is positive semi-definite is integral if each entry is integral. So this is a bit of a stronger condition. We can see if this holds, then all entries are always integral, but not the other way around necessarily. So we cannot always decompose it in this form. So this is a bit of a stronger condition. Moreover, uh, for the people here who are familiar with the paper by the Carly Silver, Silva and Tunchell, maybe recognize that this is a bit of a, a, a yeah, different representation than used over there. And that's because they use an embedding in terms of extended matrices. Here, we do not use that embedding. So uh, we do not treat the first column and row as, uh, as special cases. So that's why it differs a bit. But okay, having this property, we can now define what is total dual integrality for SDPs. And it reads as follows. So a linear matrix inequality that we have here, where all the data matrices are integral, 
we call it totally dual integral if for any vector b that is again integral the sdp dual to this semi-definite optimization problem always has an, an optimal solution that satisfies this property pz whenever it has an optimal solution so we can all see here that the second part of this looks very familiar it looks very much like the tde condition for uh, polyhedra and so it's almost uh, say uh, similar in that sense well and this could be used to identify spectrohedron that are integral but we can also use it to find a closed form expression for a certain type of spectrohedra by this uh, result here so suppose we have a spectrohedron p that has uh, integral data matrices ai which are is bounded which has a linear matrix inequality that is total totally dual integral and it also uh, should satisfy Slater's condition. So for the optimization problem over P, then we can define here um, a, a matrix B and a vector D as follows. So any row actually corresponds to a subset of the integers from one to N and any column corresponds to a constraint in our original SDP. Um, and how do we define it? Well, on the uh, row defined by uh, or induced by a subset S, we take the trace in a product between AI and is rank one matrix induced by the subset S. For the right hand side D, we do the same, but here we also apply a rounding step, we round down due to the Schwarzschild-Gomery uh, procedure, of course. And then we can prove that the Schwarzschild-Gomery closure of P is equal to this polytope here given by B and D. So it is indeed a polyhedral, and we know exactly what Schwarzschild-Gomery cuts are needed to describe the closure, um, but note that there are exponentially many. So to the power n that's the, the at most huh? that's an upper bound on the number of uh, inequalities needed but it could also be less well this looks quite theoretical so how can we actually um, use this theorem or what does it say well first if c is additionally such that this trace and product here is already integers so if with the rounding down step does not help us then in fact uh, we can see that then the Schwarzschild-Gomery closure of P is equal to the set P itself. And because we know the spectral unit is bounded, we, it has a finite Schwarzschild rank, it turns out that this P should be integral. So it should be an integral spectra even. So this property would help us to identify integral spectra hydra. And on the other side, if that is not the case, of course, this gives us just a closed form expression for um, the first Schwarzschild-Gomery closure, which could be helpful if we would like to optimize over that. Now for polyhedra, there is a nice result, namely um, for any rational polyhedron, there exists always a totally dual integral system that represents that set. We pose it here as an open problem. It could be nice if there would be such an analog also for spectrohedron. It will probably be with a bit more technicalities if it even would exist, we don't know. But that would give a nice um, result because then identifying or obtaining the Schwarzschild-Gomery closure would just boil down to finding this totally dual integral representation. Um, okay, so th this is what I, here I wanna end the, the theoretical part of the presentation. Now let's move on to the more uh, practical part. So how can we apply those type of cuts for solving integer SDPs? Well, let's first look at what has been done in the literature. So some of the uh, solution approaches are as follows. The first one is uh, skip SDP. What do they do? They relax first the integrality assumption, and then they try in a branch and bound algorithm uh, to solve the problem using continuous SDPs as subproblems. Um, and they use a lot of advanced solver components to speed up the process. Another project is by Kobayashi and Takano. They do actually the opposite thing. So they um, relax first the PSD constraint, then they're solving an integer linear programming problem, and dynamically they add constraints to uh, establish the PSD constraint iteratively. And finally, there's also YALMIP. It's a um, um, building uh, on MATLAB, if you're familiar with it. And it also supports solving integer SDPs, but um, in the literature, there's no uh, paper on what's exactly going on uh, there. So we don't know exactly what they, what they do. And our numerical results actually turn out that currently the branch and cut algorithm is the major one in terms of computation time. So it has the best uh, performance, at least that follows from our uh, numerical results and also from numerical results uh, in the literature. 
And this probably has to do with the very advanced stage of the current ILP solvers, which of course this algorithm greatly depends upon. So we decided to extend on that algorithm, of course, also because we have a bunch of cuts, we would like to include them. So it's very natural to use a branch and cut algorithm for that task. Okay, so let's first recap on how that algorithm actually, uh, yeah, what it actually does. So it starts with initializing a set F here, which takes the diagonal of our linear matrix inequality, and it requires that this should be non-active. So this could be seen as the polyhedral part of this spectrohedron, we call that the set F. Now we initialize with setting the set calligraphic P equal to the set F, and we start optimizing our objective function, so our original objective function over this polyhedral set P. Um, and also we require that all the variables should be integral. So uh, we use here, uh, uh, yeah, this is just an ILP problem. So we use some ILP solver to do this, some branch and bounds uh, type of algorithm. But additionally, we add here a dynamic constraint generator that is known as a lazy constraint callback. Well, what does it do? Whenever in the branch and bound tree there is an integral solution identified, yeah, we call it x hat here, then we check whether the PSD constraint is satisfied. Well, two things can happen. First, when it is indeed satisfied, then we know that this point is in fact feasible for our original problem. So it gives us a lower bound on the problem and maybe we can use to prune the tree on, uh, on some places and everything is okay. But if not, then somehow we need to identify or find a cut to cut off the current point, and we add that cut to the set P, and we add it there forever. So in the uh, approach that follows on all the subproblems, we add this cut. So uh, we start solving back, uh, going back to step two, and the combination between those two steps actually guarantee that this indeed finds an optimal solution to the integer SDP. Well, of course, the magical Thing that happens here in this step, so how to identify a cut that cuts off the current point. What is proposed by Kobayashi and Takano is as follows. And we know if this is not positive semi-definite, this expression, then it has at least a strictly negative eigenvalue. So we can always find an eigenvector D corresponding to that eigenvalue. And then we know that the trace in a product between the expression here and D, D transpose, is currently negative for the point X hat. But of course, it should be non-negative, so we can add this cut here, which we can rewrite uh, in terms of coefficients at the one here on the right. So this separation routine only uses the PSD constraint, only uses spectral properties. Actually, it forgets the fact that we are solving an integer problem. So it separates the point from the spectrohedron, but not necessarily uh, from or also from the integer hull, but it does not exploit the fact that we are solving an integer problem. And we would like to improve on that. Um, so what is our approach? I presented here first very generically. So what we would like to find is some dual matrix U in the SDP cone, such that it has an integral trace in a product with all our data matrices AI, and such that the current cut over here is um, not satisfied by the current point X hat. And then we would like to add a Schwatter-Gomery cut that looks as follows. Yeah, we establish here the cut, but we also can apply a rounding step because we have chosen this such that this is integral. So the left-hand side is integral, so we can gain by rounding down. And this would be a separator that both exploits the positive semi-definite constraint, but it also exploits integrality, meaning that this point actually sep uh, this separator actually separates the point from the first of a Gomery closure of P. So it can be a deeper cut. So I would like to um, clear out that a bit by this very simple graphical representation in two dimensions. So suppose that um, here P is our spectrohedron that we have. The dark blue area is the Schwarzschild-Gomery closure, the first Schwarzschild-Gomery closure of this uh, set. And we currently are here at this lattice point X hat um, because we always separate on integer points that is currently not in the set P. Well, then the algorithm by Kobayashi and Takano uses this supporting hyperplane to separate it from the spectrohedron P. Um, of course, it cuts off the current point, but we can do a bit better. Namely, we can shift this cut towards the Schwarzschild-Gomery closure, actually towards the first until it hits an integral point. That's how we can look um, geometrically at the Schwarzschild-Gomery uh, procedure. And this gives us a deeper cut. Um, 
Of course, they both do the same thing. So they both cut off X hat, but the second, the dotted line is actually preferred because it's deeper, meaning that if we add that cut later on in all the sub problems, we hope that it gives a tighter relaxations and uh, relaxation and that we do not need as much branching nodes as before. So that's what we hope here. Of course, I should say something about this separation routine. So how do we actually identify those uh, matrices U? Well, here we propose two things, two options. The first one is a problem specific approach because we always sub, uh, separate on integral points. We know there is a lot of structure going on. So we can often apply this problem uh, structure to identify a separator in combination with a rounding step. So this I will uh, clarify for an example, quadratic traveling salesman problem that I will look at in a minute. Um, and this can uh, be done for specific problems, but we can also be a bit more uh, generic. So for the class of the binary SDPs, we um, find a more general separator. Of course, this is still a very important class in common and total optimization problems. Many of the SDPs are indeed having uh, zero one variables. And that separator is based on this theorem by Dukanovic, Randall, Latchford, and Sorensen, which gives a characterization of binary SDP matrices. So a binary symmetric matrix is positive semi-definite if and only if we can write it here as the sum of rank one symmetric binary matrices. So this gives some combinatorial um, kind of way of looking at those matrices. And we could use this to uh, get to certificates of non-positive semi-definiteness that we could use in combination with a schwatt um rounding step to do that. So I will not present here this uh, separator in detail, but it um, boils down to application of this theorem. Okay, for now, I would like to go to this uh, problem-specific approach in the application of on the quadratic traveling salesman problem. So that's um, the, the fourth uh, topic on the talk. So of course, first I need to um, yeah, introduce the problem. So the QTSP is, as you would uh, of course expect, the quadratic version of the linear TSP. And we look at the asymmetric version, the fight on directed graphs. And the goal there is to find uh, a tour, so a cycle visiting all the vertices exactly once, starting and ending at the same vertex, that minimizes now not linear cost, but a total interaction cost among the arcs that are used. So if we have two arcs that are adjacent in the graph and they are both used in the tour, then we incur a certain quadratic cost Q. Uh, so that's what we would like to minimize. And this finds its origin in bioinformatics, but also has other applications, for instance, robotics or uh, precision farming. Let's uh, try to model this problem first. So we need some terminology. First, uh, G is our graph. It's a directed simple graph with vertex set V, arc set A. And we define here the set of the so-called tour matrices T and of G, which uh, contain all the characteristic matrices of Hamiltonian cycles in the graph. Meaning that if we have a certain Hamiltonian cycle C, then we put a one on position IJ, if that arc is used and zero otherwise. And the set T and of G contains all those uh, matrices. Then what we also need is a set of the so-called two arcs in the graph, which actually are the directed nodes or vertex triples i, j, k of uh, vertices that it can be placed in succession on the graph. So if both i, j and j, k are in the arc set and they are distinct, then uh, it is contained in the set of the two arcs. And we need that to define our cost structure Q, which has entries Q, i, j, k, um, where i, j, k means the cost of um, traversing i, j, and k in that order successively in the tour. So it is only non-zero if this is a two arc, yeah, and otherwise we set it equal to zero. And with all those definitions, we can now model the problem as follows. So we try to minimize over this set t, n of g, and the function that we minimize looks as follows, which reads that if an arc i, j is used in the tour, and an arc j, k are, is used in the tour, so if though both variables are one, then we incur the cost q, i, j, k. So this is clearly a quadratic problem, right? And we try to solve this problem now via an, interior, via an integer semi-definite programming formulation for that. So let's see how we construct that. 
Um, first, what we need is a linear objective function because SDPs have linear objective functions. So we need some linearization step. Well, what we can do, we can do this by a standard procedure. Yeah, we substitute the product here by a new variable y i j k, and we establish this connection between those two variables by introducing so-called coupling constraints. They can uh, be uh, be derived like this. What does it mean? Well, if a certain arc i j is used in the tour, so if x i j here is one, then there should be exactly one arc, two arc leaving that arc, and also one two arc entering that arc. So that are exactly those summations. Whereas if x i j is zero, so the arc is not used, then everything around that arc should be zero. So it's not very hard to prove that if the axes are integral, if the y's are non-negative, and we have those coupling constraints, then indeed we establish this exact connection between the axes and the y's. And that enables us to present here the following equivalent linearized formulation of the QTSP. So we indeed substituted here now uh, y i j k. We uh, recognize the constraints that we have over here. And x is still to be in this set t n of g. Of course, we still should say something about how to represent that set. Uh, that's not so uh, straightforward. So a first attempt we could do is by uh, the observation that in, uh, in a tour, there's always one arc leaving each vertex and one other arc um, entering each vertex, meaning in this matrix um, set that the matrices here should all have column and row sum equal to one. Yeah, so it should be a permutation matrix. Moreover, we want that x i j is zero whenever the combination of the vertices i j is not an arc in the graph. So we call this set the set of the permutation matrices implied by a graph, and we denote it by this uh, p phi n of g. So it's not difficult to argue that the set t n of g should be a subset of this set. However, this is in general not sufficient, right? Because if the matrix X is in the set phi n of g, yeah, in fact, it, it could be seen as the adjacency matrix of a graph, uh, namely of a vertex disjoint cycle cover. So we know that we will have some cycles there that visit every vertex exactly once, but we can have multiple cycles. Yeah? We can have multiple subtours, which is, I think, the, yeah, the, the very common pain in the neck of the TSP. So somehow we have to uh, deal with that. And we can do that as follows. So we say for su such a matrix that it is, in fact, a tour matrix if this directed graph induced by this matrix is connected. Because if, if we have connectivity, then we can have only one cycle in this cycle cover. And then, in fact, it is a tour. So key property here is connectivity. In fact, algebraic connectivity of this directed graph um, that we use to prove the following theorem. So suppose we have a, vert, a matrix X in the set pi n of G. Then, in fact, it is a tour matrix if and only if the following uh, linear matrix inequality here is, uh, is satisfied, where beta and alpha are constants that rely on the cosine of 2 pi over n. Well, those um, scalars, they follow from the spectra of directed, the directed cycle on n nodes. That's where uh, we got this from. And the proof of this is basically saying that the algebraic connectivity is strictly positive if and only if uh, the graph is connected. And that is what we use here um, to obtain this result. So it should be saying here that this is an analog of a an, uh, similar result on undirected graphs for the symmetric TSP that was established here by Svetkovic and those two other researchers, which names I will not even try to pronounce, as you will uh, understand. Uh, but it, it's a, a useful property in the sense that we can now model the QTSP as an integer SDP in the following way. Here we recognize all the constraints that we have uh, obtained so far. Uh, here we have the permutation matrix constraints. And finally, we see here our linear matrix inequality and, of course, the restriction that X should be uh, binary. So it is indeed an ISDP. And I should also mention here, I hope I can, uh, yeah, I can surprise you a bit with the fact that this very hard or difficult QTSP um, can be modeled in a very compact way. Yeah, we have a really a uh, small number of constraints here because we uh, capture a lot of the structure of the problem in this combination between positive semi-definiteness and integrality. So this is uh, interesting because it gives us an 
very compact formulation of this problem. Okay, now that we have the formulation, let's try to apply our methods that we um, constructed on this specific problem. So our branch and cut algorithm, as we said, starts optimizing over the polyhedral set, which we called F here. And this just contains all constraints except for this positive semi-definite constraint that we had. We start optimizing here using some ILP solver. And then at cert a certain point, we could have an integral solution Y hat X hat in a branching tree. Um, and we check whether this linear matrix inequality is satisfied for the current point. So we can check this by checking the smallest eigenvalue. Well, if this is indeed non-negative, then we have found a tour matrix. So we have found a solution to the QTSP and everything is fine. But if not, then somehow we would like to separate this point. But now we have some additional information. Namely, it follows from the constraints in F that this X hat is the adjacency matrix of a vertex disjoint cycle cover, where we have at least two cycles you know, following from the problem structure. And we can use that to identify dual matrices uh, to cut off the current point. Well, this can be done in, uh, in several ways. In the paper, we present six of those um, type of cutting planes that we can now obtain. Here, we, I will present only uh, one of them that boils down on finding an integral eigenvector corresponding to the negative eigenvalue of this expression. Yeah? Because it is not positive semi-definite, it has a negative eigenvalue. And in this case, it also has an integral eigenvector, which can be constructed as follows. So if we have the cycles in our cycle cover, yeah, this induces a partition as one till SK on the vertex set V. And now for any set as J, we can define a vector Vj that puts a certain weight on the vertices in that set and a certain other weight on the vertices that not, are not in that set. And then we can prove that currently the trace in a product between Vj, Vj transpose, and this expression here for the current point x hat is strictly negative. But of course, it should be non-negative as follows from the general fact on uh, SDP matrices. So we can include that cut to cut off the current point. Um, but we can, in fact, do uh, apply a strengthening here by the Schwarzer-Gomery procedure, because we have identified the eigenvector as being integral, meaning that the Vj, Vj transpose here is integral. So the left-hand side is integral. And we can now round down the right-hand side. And recall here that the beta and the alpha were defined by the cosine of 2 pi over n. So this is typically non-integral. So we can really gain something from this rounding down step. OK, and this is just one, as I said, one of the classes of the cuts that we obtain. And we have uh, obtained more of them. OK, now in the final minutes that I have, I would like to uh, show some computational results of this method that we did for the QTSP. Um, so what did we do? We um, included various settings of separators you know, where we took different combination of the combinations of Schwarzer-Gomery cuts that we included. So in total, we um, defined five different settings of our branch and cut algorithm. We implement that in, using Julia. Um, and we use Gurobi as our underlying mixed integer linear programming solver. We uh, did some tests on almost 500 instances. Some of them come from uh, practical applications like the one in bioinformatics. Others are randomly generated. And we compare our results with the other ISDP solvers, the one from Kobayashi Takano, the Skip SDP, and also the solver from Yalmip. So here I will present just one figure of the results. So what are we looking at? Um, this is for one of the bioinformatic instances. So it's a set of instances where each data point uh, corresponds to exactly one instance. On the horizontal axis, we see the uh, number of vertices in the instance. And on the vertical axis, we see the computation time needed to solve the instance uh, in a logarithmic scale. Well, uh, here we see the results of skip SDP. Here, the blue line, it can solve uh, instance up to n is equal to 15. And the red line over here is the one from Kobayashi and Takano. So it performs, uh, as you can see, indeed a bit better in terms of computation time, at least. And below the five lines below that you see are the uh, settings of our improved branch and cut algorithm that you see. The one from Yalmip is not included here because that line uh, lies uh, significantly above here. So uh, to keep the presentation clear, I did not 
include that, uh, that solver in this picture. And as you can see, the computation times in general are reduced significantly, even compared, if we compare it to skip SDP, we could even say uh, that it improves uh, several orders of magnitude. So, um, and because we have those reduced computation times, this also um, uh, has its result in the number of instances that we can solve. That we can solve uh, more instances of the bioinformatics data set and also in the sizes of the instances that we can solve, of course. This is, uh, uh, of course, correlated. So we see that we could solve all our uh, instances within five minutes using our best um, branch and cut setting that we have. And the largest instance that we could solve has almost 25, uh, 2,700 vertices and more than 5,000 arcs. Um, it should be noted here, of course, this graph is very sparse. As you can see, it uh, is a planner graph that comes from um, an application in precision farming, but still the order of this matrix is very large. It's uh, almost 2,700, so that we really have a lot of variables there. So it's uh, very nice that we could solve that instance. It's currently the largest QTSP instances that uh, is solved in the literature. And now a general question, of course, and this works well for this specific problem, the QTSP, but can we also uh, suspect, expect uh, such results for other problems or even for general ISDPs? So that do not only have this problem specific separator, but also have more general um, separation routines. Okay, and with that question, I would like to uh, go to the conclusions. So what have we seen? Well, first we looked at the theoretical um, part of the talk where we extended the Schwatagomri procedure to the integer SDPs. We saw some results, for instance, uh, we could um, provide an uh, equivalent, more explicit uh, definition of the Schwatagomri closure for spectrohedron. We looked at um, improved branch and cut framework where we exploit those type of cuts and we applied all this to an uh, integer SDP formulation that we constructed for the QTSP. And now some uh, insights, I would like to give two insights here with uh, uh, some future directions. What we first saw is that modeling those problems as integer SDPs gives a lot of insight. If we recall to the QTSP, this um, model was very compact and it gives us a bit more insight in the structure of those problems. Maybe it gives us new inequalities that were not so uh, obvious when we only looked at it from a combinatorial point of view. Um, so it's nice to see whether also for other problems we can find those formulations. And we also saw on the practical point of view that this worked very well for the QTSP. And as I already indicated on the previous slide, we would like to know whether this um, can also be repeated for other type of problems or maybe for general ISDPs. Uh, but this is all um, yeah, work for the future that we are actually currently working on in a new project. Um, so I hope that will uh, turn out nice. Uh, so yeah, for now, this is it. I would like already to thank you for your attention. Again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Um, and maybe there are some, uh, some questions left. Okay, let's thank Frank for his nice talk. Are there any questions? So maybe I'll start off with one. You mentioned an implementation. Is that publicly available? Sorry? Is your uh, implementation that you used for your timings pu publicly available on your website or somewhere else? Um, no, currently not. So um, we, uh, we, we put the data online that is currently on the GitHub, but not the, the separators. But this is something to. Uh, yeah, actually, I can put it online. Yes. Uh, okay, that's great. great. Uh, Henry, you have your hand up? Yes. Um, so uh, very often these cuts are, are used uh, after relaxations. So here for your problems, you, you seem to have applied these cuts right away. Do you have any yeah. idea what would happen if you uh, for example, try to do uh, SDP relaxation first or some other relaxation first and then start adding these cuts? Yeah, so um, maybe what I can answer that is with this uh, procedure by Kobayashi Takano. They also did in that paper 
somewhat what you describe now. So they um, relax first uh, integrality, or no, they relax first uh, the positive semi-definite constraint, then solve it to optimality. And then after that, on the optimal of that, they um, apply those cuts. I don't, is that what you mean there? Well, I sort of mean for the integer constraints, well, let's say the zero one would be the easiest. You could add, you can do as a STP relaxation and then get some sort of relaxation solution and then start adding uh, these extra cuts to improve on your STP relaxation. Yeah. Or a doubly non-negative relaxation. Yeah, yeah, that could, that could be uh, interesting. So this is a bit like related to uh, to just the, the the one from Gomery, like the the Gomery type of uh, method for LPs, right? Where it used this simplex tableau to obtain cuts. Yeah, so that that's an, we didn't try uh, we didn't try that. Um, I also don't know whether we can always find such a, a cut. So I know for the LP case, it can be found from the simplex tableau um, because we know it's a, we have obtained a vertex in the LP. Um, so in general, the separation problem for general Schwarzenegger cuts is MP hard. So I would not immediately know how to extend that in that way. And of course, we because we only separate on integral points, we use the we use the property, the fact that it is integral to solve this separation problem, which makes it much easier. So I think if you do this on uh, the SDP, fractional SDP solution, then in general, it will be hard to find such a cut. So, uh, but it's, it's definitely an interesting way of, yeah, how, at least how strong they are. Uh, and that could, so finding, I think there's also a result by um, uh, Lodi and Fischetti where they um, apply, they try to solve this separation problem using an ILP. We could do the same thing. That's what we did uh, apply. So we try to find, an, um, based on a fractional solution, try to find a Schwarzenegger cut that has the largest deviation. So the, that is actually the strongest, but solving that is again a mixed integer SDP. So solving that is, is equally difficult as solving the original problem. But we did that to identify how strong those cuts can be. Um, yeah, so that's a bit in that direction, but uh, yeah. It's and also for this uh, smallest eigenvalue that you, that you use to get the eigenvector mm -hmm. and get the cut, why just stick to one negative eigenvalue? Why not take uh, a few? Yeah, so that's that's what we do. Um, so for all the S1 to SK, we can define such an eigenvector, Vj, and they are all negative here and all correspond to the same negative eigenvalue. So the, the number of negative eigenvalues of this expression is equal to the number of cycles in, uh, in, the, in the current graph induced by this matrix. So we need to capture all the negative eigenvalues for each of them we have. Uh, uh, yeah, equal to the multiplicity of that eigenvalue, that many cuts do we add here? Okay, any other questions online or in person? If not, let's thank Frank again. Thank you. Is your talk online? Uh, yeah, this, this room will stay open if you want to keep talking here. Uh, next week, oh. don't forget, we have this uh, algebraic enumeration conference here at Waterloo starting on Tuesday, going to Friday. And the final talk of the week will be the official tech colloquium given by Ian and David talking about their reminiscences of their time here at Waterloo. So don't, don't uh, forget to attend that. So thanks, everyone. Uh, see you next week. And uh, yeah, if you want to stay and talk, anyone online or in person here, then I'll keep this room open. Um, I can send them 